Welcome to the sixth episode of Shadows Cast from the Casting Shadows blog. It's been a long time since episode five because basically I've had nothing to say. In this episode, we'll be looking at Korea as usual. This time, we'll look at the rainy season. And we'll be looking at an overview of the service I've recently gotten from a dice provider called GameStation.net. We'll do uh, an installment on putting a long-running campaign on indefinite hiatus for reasons outside the game. We'll be looking at soundtracks, mainly the idea of the, the ritual of using sound in your game and subtlety. Finally, we'll continue on with the theme of improvisation in gameplay, not scripting everything out from the GM side of the screen. Okay? What's required for this to work? What's required from the players? And what's required from the GM in order to make a real sandbox come to life for all the players there. That's episode six, Shadows Cast. Let's get to it. I'm of two minds when it comes to using music while gaming. I do like to use it to cover background noise and to affect my mood, but I don't like to use music as a mallet to force the players into a particular mood or atmosphere. In my experience, it doesn't actually work. It does the opposite. It prevents immersion by grounding the player's sense of atmosphere in a pre-existing film or, or intellectual property that they have experienced in the real world. They're not thinking of your game, they're thinking of that setting. This isn't always true, it's not always true for all players, but I find it goes that way more often than not. At some point somebody comments about the looping of the track or the cool scene where this tune was used or whatever. <laughs> or worse, they ask if they can put a different soundtrack on it they would rather hear. I feel that to use soundtracks in gaming effectively, it needs to be subtle. And as the primary focus of, let's say, reality in the game world is the game master, then if the soundtrack is supporting what you're doing, players really shouldn't notice it. Where I have found soundtracks to be extremely effective is in the ritual of your game. Meaning, the players are filing in, they're taking their custom seats, they're in their usual banter mode, chatting away. But if your campaign has a theme song, or each story has a, has a theme song, you can very quickly help people get into character just by playing. You're ready, you've got your notes ready, everybody's got their jollies out, and it's time to play. Dice come out, song starts, and people are lifted into another space. They're not playing yet, they're not their character yet, but they know it's game time. That works really well. If you maintain that, so oh, this is the combat song, and this is the theme song for this character and that character, and this is the, oh, you've totally screwed the pooch now song, it has the opposite effect. You stopped what you were doing in order to play a song, which is not happening in the, in the game world. There's no you know, heavenly soundtrack thundering down uh, to indicate you've won this encounter. So the only recourse, really, is for the players to slip back out of character, back into your living room or wherever it is that you're playing, and congratulate themselves or slap themselves around for purely metagame reasons. 
Why do that? Choose music they don't know. Play it at a low volume. Maybe they don't really hear it. You don't want them listening to it anyway. It's there to support. It's there to be subtle. It's not there to do your job for you. Ritual and subtlety. Okay, so two examples. Call of Cthulhu. Now, I have collected a large amount of contemporary music for the 20s and 30s. When the characters walk into a speakeasy or in some place where they might actually encounter music, I love to play it then. This is what you hear. This is actually what you hear. And it's bright, and it's desperate, and it doesn't take them out of the scene. It plants them in it. They know that there's some otherworldly horror making a nuisance of itself, and yet all around them, people are dancing and carrying on. It enhances gameplay. The recordings are terrible. It's not going to distract them to the point where they're trying to listen to the lyrics or figure out if there's some hidden message. It's simply background music, similar to playing a storm soundtrack or a surf noise soundtrack, uh, will enhance. Second example. I ran a vampire, well, actually a, a linked World of Darkness uh, chronicle, for a very long time. Each chronicle had its own uh, specific soundtrack. One song which captured the primary theme of what we were trying with that particular set of characters. And some nights, I would surprise people by asking them to play a different set of characters than we were expecting. They may have come to play mage, but I had them play their mortals for most of the night. Or they may have come to play vampire, and they wound up spending half the night running their werewolves, and half the night running their their mages. All to gain insight into one of the other games. And we could signal this just by playing the, the theme song for the other groups. So they come in thinking, okay, tonight we're playing vampire. And they hear a particular song, and they, oh, we're not, but we're going to learn something about vampire, because that's what we were expecting to play. Now, this game, like I said, lasted for years. And we opened with a nice cliché uh, song from Joy Division, and the opening chords of which, to this day, take us back to that chronicle. Every time we'd sit down, and when we got to the point that we were ready to play, that was the first song on the list. And as we neared the end of the song, we started to recap the events from the last session. Everybody's trying to adopt the particular mannerisms of their character, and by the time the song was over, they were in character. Or close enough, for government work, anyway. Said my piece. Subtlety. Ritual. Okay, so what we're looking at is a FedEx Express package. I ordered dice. Lots of weird dice for games like Dungeon Crawl Classics, which, as you know, I probably will never, ever run. But anyway, I ordered from GameStation, and I ordered on Sunday. It's now Friday. These arrived last night, considering I live in Korea, and they were sent from uh, somewhere in the States, Kentucky. That's not bad. So as you can see, I ordered a lot of a lot of dice to build my perfect uh, fantasy dice set. Let's take a look inside. Okay, so in the bag, they're packed loose. It's a bubble pack. Not so bad, the dice are way down there at the bottom. Doesn't look like much, does it? Let's take a look. We have the 12-piece 
set on the small quartz. 12 piece diamond. And they didn't have the moonstone in a 12 piece pack, so I ordered them in individually. And they came like that. And then all the extras I ordered to pad out the set. I like to have a lot of extra D6s and whatnot. Okay. 30 sided dice are much larger than I expected. And the seven sided die are just as retarded looking as they looked online. There you go. So this order was for a Zaki set, right? So, and it was for the Blue Moonstone, which we have, and we can easily see that in comparison to the Sapphire. This is the 12-piece Sapphire set. We also ordered a uh, Tiger's Eye set, and the large dice bag with the extras. So we ordered pawns for placement and support uh, blue moonstone dice. And you can see that uh, my initial ideas that these might be the sapphire dice are completely incorrect. They're just a different color <coughs> of blue moonstone. The sapphire dice are very, very blue. All right, let's check numbers. So we have the 12 piece. better looking, uh, even than I expected. And then the additional dice. Just the dice, thanks. Alright. So I had ordered extra D20, extra D10 set, you can see the color is extremely different. Okay, this is the tens, uh, 1 to 10, and this is the tens, the percent die. Okay. But they're definitely not a sapphire color. So I ordered additional, additional D6s, and these additional dice to replace the very dark ones that I got the first time. Now that is a diamond D8, okay, which I ordered to round out my additional set. And two extra sapphire D4s and two extra tiger's eye D6s, which just both rolled ones. Here endeth the lesson. So let's take a slightly closer look at the dice. Now all of these are ostensibly blue moonstone. I think it's pretty clear 
that uh, the colors are quite different. So let's just pick out a die. This is a D24. Okay, it's a very blue color. Okay, now the D24 from the sapphire set. Well, that's extremely blue. But just so you can see. All right, so just among the Blue Moonstone set itself, as we saw before, all the D6s match each other in color, but if we take the D16 and put it next to them, there's a sense that it's a little darker. And the D8, of course, is much, much lighter. Okay. And we could almost be forgiven for thinking that these D8s, right, are from a completely different set. Okay, now this one is clearly a clear one, a diamond one. Okay. But if we take the D10, now the D10s from this set are very pointed, right? And they match very well with uh, the D14. Okay. Now there's a Kickstarter going on right now to replace this shape of D14 with a spherical D14, and I'm all for that. Uh, not a big fan of of this shape. It's fine in a in a normal D10. Uh, but when exaggerated out like this, uh, it starts to be a bit of an annoyance for me. Uh, but you know, your mileage may vary. So just comparing the colors of these, right? they should be similar to the size and, and shape, and yet they're clearly very different. So that's a bit of a quality control issue. Now, if we look... Uh, if we look instead at the sapphire ones, we see a, a much more consistent color. Right? The sixes are the same, but when you compare them to the, the D5 or you know even the D3, uh, they're quite consistent. So there you go. Now the D10 is probably the darkest of them all. But it doesn't really stand out. Whereas when again you come back to the moonstone, you can very clearly see, you know, the 20 is very light. The D10 is almost clear. It's not. It is. The D8s are practically clear. Right. So it almost looks like we have two different sets of dice represented. These dice are very similar, right? Now there's a D4, which is visibly lighter than this other D4 in the same order, right? Or from the same order. So there you go. If you're interested in this color, the blue moon moonstone, this is the color that is represented on the website, but a significant portion, some even in the same shapes, are practically clear. Okay. Now these do not match the diamond dice. There's definitely some color to these dice, but you know, this doesn't really feel like a match set like that does. This section is about taking your long-term campaign and putting it on indefinite hiatus. Now, I think we can all understand that this might not be what you'd like to do, 
It's something that you have to do. Life as a way of getting in the way of games. And that's really what's going on with us right now, so that's why I've picked this topic for this episode. Um, I've been running a MechWarrior campaign now for just about two years, and it's happening in email. You've heard about it before in previous Shadows Cast episodes. And basically, we've got a player in Scotland, we have two players in Montreal, we had uh, one player in the Yukon, and I'm in Korea. So things like uh, running it through a chat or a Google Hangout just really don't work for us. It, it's email or a forum, you know, or, or not at all. And we've managed to do this consistently with a solid posting rate for just under two years. So that's not bad. And the game is just now reaching the point that we... Uh, that we imagined it would be like when we sat down to play it. And it's time to pull the plug. Why? This is going to sound like I'm laying blame, but I'm not doing that because I love all people. Now, the reason why we have to stop is basically life has affected a number of us, and uh, we just don't quite have the amount of time to invest in things like sleeping. Uh, which are good for memory, retention, and health. And so it's it's difficult to to make sense of the game when it's split up over literally millions of email messages. So I really don't blame the two people who went and had a baby. Not even a little bit. Anyway, so we have to bring the game <clears throat> to an indefinite end. We would all like to get back to it. We're not sure that we will. So what do you do in this case? Do you just stop playing and hope to get back to it? No, that's what we used to do long ago when we had infinite access to time and game groups and there was another game around the corner. We're not going to do that now. We have skill. So what are we going to do? We're going to plan. We're going to plan like we're going to come back to this soon. And that means we need to find a, an ending point for each character, a distinct ending point for each character, that can also be an enticing beginning. And we need to make them distinct enough and separate enough so that if on that future occasion when we get back together, not everybody is available, that it works within the context of what, what we set up. So. We need to find a natural breaking point, a way to end the current action and scatter the characters in a way that they can remain scattered or come back together in different groupings, depending on the way uh, the next hand is dealt in our lives. So, Mech Warrior. Like I said, two years. And we're in the second story. So if we had been playing face-to-face, -face, this would be somewhere between session 8 and 12. Uh, probably between 10 and 12. The characters have had some experience spent on them. They've developed. They've developed new contacts. Uh, they've got a grounding in the world now. The players are, are up on many of the rules. And this would be the point where the campaign would be hitting its stride. So, of course, it has to end, right? So, now I'm writing the final post. What we did was we reached a natural break, an actual climax, which coincided fairly well with the time limit I gave myself for ending the game <laughs> to return time and, and whatnot to our, our new parents. And uh, at that point, I closed out that particular scene and transitioned to a new scene where the characters were basically saying goodbye to each other. Uh, new assignments uh, were looming for them. And I gave them the opportunity to discuss what had been going on, pool their information and knowledge. 
say goodbye and argue with each other a little bit about, oh, you should come with me, or, or no, you should go out on your own, and, and whatnot. After everybody had worked through what they wanted to do, or what they felt was important, and we reached a few crisis points on, should I do this, or should I do that, or how could I do this, or how could I do that, at that point, I called the game completely and began writing the final post. I'm not going to reveal how it turns out, but the key point is giving each character solo focus enough to give them that goal, the goal that either carries them on forever away from this campaign, or pulls the character and the player together back into playing it again in the future. Now, as an aside, this kind of ending is the perfect opportunity to do report cards. Right? Getting evaluations from your players on your methodology and your imagery, the things that worked for the players, the things that didn't work for the players, what they want to see more or less of. And it's your opportunity to do the same, right? To give feedback on the players as players, right? Uh, so that when you do get the chance to come back together again, everybody has had a chance to think about what you, they did well and what uh, was problematic, and everything will be better, right? Skill enhancement. It's a key point here on the Casting the Shadows blog and on the Shadows Cast episodes. Anyway, thanks for listening. This section is now at a definite end. This segment is about improvisation. Improvisation on both sides of the screen and the game master, and the players, and how do you get there? In previous episodes of Shadows Cast, we have talked about sandbox campaigns, and we've talked about discovering the story, and that's all well and good if you know how to get there. But if you're trying this for the first time, how do you get there? Or maybe you've been running sandbox campaigns for ages, but you've been doing them not so much as simulation, but as you know, running avatars of yourself in, in your game world. Or you have been running them uh, in a more narrative style uh, where the give and take of what is and is not happening can shift and what was true five minutes ago in your mind has now been replaced with something else that seems better. We're not talking about that. We're talking about improvisation in a simulationist game world where there is a baseline of reality and it is possible to achieve immersion in your character. But how? Well, First things first, it's an unreasonable expectation to believe that a given group of players can achieve a reasonable level of immersion in new characters, in a new setting, in a new system. If you want to achieve a good level of immersion, with believable, realistic actions in your believable, realistic world, or the believable, realistic, internally consistent fantasy world, or science fiction world, or whatever, the internally consistent world that you're running. If you want this to happen, you need to let the players practice. It's as simple as that. It's a skill just like anything else. How do we get there? The system first needs to go away. We don't need to play rules light. We just need to know what the rules are. We need to know when they're applied. We need to know how they're applied. And the only way that that happens is by playing the game. Right? We can read the rule book all we want, but it doesn't become internalized until we've actually been through, been down the block with it a ways. So when you're setting up your game, you have to resort to a little on uh, artificiality in starting out with a progression of scenes 
which will by their nature explore the game system, explore the setting, and explore the characters' relationships to each other. Now to use uh, Hair of the Dog, the Mech Warrior campaign that you can find on the Casting Shadows blog, to use that as an example, you'll see that in the early posts, the characters are being reintroduced to the world of Battletech, larger than life, you know, and they're thrust into a scene where they must suddenly become heroes. Somebody has bombed uh, public assembly in the school at which they're instructors on the very day when the enemy comes to annex their world. Huge, dramatic background and a very imminent threat. And the only ones that can act are the characters. They're heroes. And that lets us transition into uh, a military scene. Who's in charge here? What are the ranks? How can we possibly resist this threat? And they got to feel their way into a rank structure and choose it, take it on for themselves. Then we moved into a mech combat to explore the new rules that were possible through the tactical addendum, and on and on and on. And as we go, the characters are emerging because the players are getting used to them, and because they're spending less time wondering how to do things. They're getting used to the format, they're getting used to each other again, they're relearning the setting, they're learning what's real in my version of this game, and they're learning how everything works. In a tabletop setting, we would have achieved very deep immersion uh, very easily. Now, one of the strengths of play-by-email is, of course, that you can go much farther with immersion in your own character, but it's counterbalanced by the very slow rate of interaction. So I would say that had we been gaming face-to-face, -face, in three or four sessions, the, the drills would have been over. Uh, but in the play-by-email format that we were using, it took much longer before the story could just flow naturally without any kind of nudging toward one kind of scene or another kind of scene to practice and, and learn. After that, it was just purely role play. And that's how you get there. You eliminate the barriers by practicing the skills it takes to turn those from barriers to just laws of reality. Practicing standard roles, opposed roles, uh, assisted roles, combat if necessary, social manipulation if necessary, any kind of mystical powers or, or whatnot. Just give the characters an opportunity to interact with the setting in a way that lets them actually explore their character and the mechanics and they will walk you away from these things. Once, once they get it, they've got it, and you don't need to return to it. Immersion. How do we get there? Same way you get to Carnegie Hall. 